Marvel Spider-Man, aka Spider-Man PS4, aka Spider-Man Remastered, certainly took the world by storm in being a new AAA superhero game developed by Insomniac Games, with the last time the webhead swung onto the video game landscape was with the Amazing Spider-Man 2 movie game, which at the time of making this video is nearly a decade old. Holy shit. And old really is the appropriate description for that game, as not only was it an underwhelming title which was poorly received across the board, however it failed to even meet the mark or improve upon Spider-Man games from the early 2000s, such as Web of Shadows, the OG Spider-Man 2, and hell, even the first TASM movie game. As a result, well, Marvel Spider-Man certainly had a lot of pressure to succeed, and thankfully the project exceeded all expectations in the public's eye, with high praise from critics and gamers alike. It was viewed as being one of the best superhero games of all time. I'm establishing all of this early on as context for this video. I myself never played Marvel's Spider-Man until late of last year. Despite this, however, I've clocked in nearly 100 hours into the game and have beaten the main game and its DLC content on multiple times across the varied difficulty settings. As a result, while well, the whole blinded by nostalgia counter-argument some people might want to make really won't apply here. With that being said, let us begin. The game really does make you feel like you're Spider-Man as early as the intro cutscene. Peter Parker is faced with a choice, pay his rent or stop Kingpin. Obviously he chooses the latter and suffers severely for his choice, however I'm jumping ahead here. Upon working alongside police captain Yuri Watanabe and the New York Police Dep Department, Spider-Man is able to not only acquire potentially incriminating information on Fisk, but also defeats him, with him being arrested and transferred over to Rikers, not before delivering a parting warning to Peter. Idiot! I'm the one who kept order in this city! One month! In one month you wish you had me back! With Fisk gone and unable to keep order within the criminal world, however, the city effectively trades one big problem for another. There are subtle signs of supervillain activity, you know, sightings of black cats start occurring and Shocker escapes from Rikers. However, the main threat emerges with Mr. Negative and the demons, who start committing various terrorist activities, including a suicide bombing at City Hall, and stealing the highly hazardous biological agent GR-27 known as Devil's Breath, with the intention of releasing it into the city with the intention of incriminating Norman Osborn. After gaining information on the demons and their plans, Spider-Man supposedly defeats Mr. Negative and the demons at Grand Central. However, this is all too temporary. Shortly afterwards, a massive breakout at both Rikers and the Raft, combined with the Sable Task Force performing inhuman acts against the innocent lives of New York, in addition to Spider-Man being severely injured and outlawed, in addition to the new mastermind of the Sinister Six, Dr. Octopus, releasing Devil's Breath, essentially creating a citywide pandemic creates debatably the worst event that Spider-Man, Yuri, and the rest of New York has ever experienced. Through working with MJ, Miles, Yuri, and even the unpredictable Silver Sable, Spider-Man is able to ultimately subdue the members of the Sinister Six through several hard battles, help the people of New York, and slowly but surely overcome this apocalyptic scenario, before meeting his match against Doc Ock, his former boss, role model, and father figure. In a desperate attempt at acquiring the cure for GR-27, Peter develops a suit of armour for his rematch against Otto. Despite nearly being killed by the villain, Peter emerges victorious and provides the anti-serum to Dr. Morgan Michaels. However, whilst this is certainly effective at curing those who are infected, Peter himself has to sacrifice the only biological parent figure remaining in his life in order to put the lives of others above his own. To truly live up to his Uncle Ben's words, with great power comes great responsibility. Okay, there's certainly a lot going on here, especially as I didn't even discuss the segments of the story from MJ and Mars's perspective. However, despite this, Marvel Spider-Man's plot feels fluent and coherent for the most part. Is it the best Spider-Man story ever told? No, I wouldn't say so. The game certainly does a good job at explaining motivations of the characters very well. It develops plot points, no matter how big or small, and even has a lot of easter eggs and fan service for longtime fans of the comics. However, at times it feels a bit too fast-paced, and I wish that certain events lasted longer. For example, when it comes to the Sinister Six, I felt like each of them had a healthy amount of interactions with Spider-Man in cutscenes and their fights. However, in gameplay, you never fight Rhino, Vulture, or Electro in their own 1v1s outside of the 1v2s, which I think was a shame, as whilst yeah, it made sense for the main villains to have multiple encounters against Pete, 
such as Mr. Negative and Otto, Scorpion had his own visually stunning fight in the third act, and even Shocker had a chase segment and his own boss fight. Make no mistake, while some of the fights that we did get were indeed great, I would have wanted at least a 1v1 fight for every villain in this game, especially as even random villains such as Tombstone, Kingpin, Silver Sable and Taskmaster get their own respective 1v1 fights against Spider-Man, yet some members of the Sinister Six are omitted from this for some reason. In Peter's first fight against Rhino, they supposedly destroyed multiple city blocks, which, I mean, come on, that would have been fantastic to see in this game. Thankfully, we did eventually get a set piece resembling this in the Miles Morales game, at least, but it just screams missed opportunity for this game. Electro being another example, as I find myself going back to the final battle of TASM 2 and think about how nice a 1v1 against this incredibly dangerous, wisecracking opponent would have been if he had his own set piece, in addition to the 1v2 that we already have in the game. But I digress. Every character, no matter how small or major, gets sufficient screen time, with some even receiving in-depth development, which I appreciate. However, let's go over them one by one, starting with the main characters. Yuri Lowenthal's Peter Parker nails all aspects of the character in this game, and despite the changes to his age and costume, he pretty much jumps right out the pages of the comics. Outside of the suit, he is the socially awkward yet extremely likeable young man who fights between his real job and his superhero job, and as Spider-Man he is confident, witty, not at all self-aware in all the right areas, which makes him overall a very likeable, fun to watch portrayal of Spider-Man. This coupled with the phenomenal voice acting made me truly feel for the guy in moments of emotional turmoil, all the way from the stress of stopping the crane, To the anger and desperation in his fight against Otto. You were everything I wanted to be! You just threw it away! To him grieving over Aunt May's death. I did. And I am so proud of you. And Ben would be too. All the people you've saved. I don't know what to do. You've probably heard the whole Toby was a great Peter, Andrew was a great Spider-Man, and Tom was great at both thing. You've probably heard of that. However, Yuri for me nails all aspects of the character and is close to being the definitive adaptation of Spider-Man for me, outside of the comics, even if I personally prefer Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. Mary Jane Watson gets a lot of hate in this verse due to her supposed toxic behavior. This is simply not the case. She gets frustrated with Peter for interfering with her investigation as he interrupts her potentially learning vital information on the demons and their plans. And this is perfectly believable since they broke up prior to the events of the game for a similar reason. Tension breaker, right. You know this is exactly why we broke up. I thought we broke up so you could focus on your career. We broke up because you wouldn't stop treating me like a baby. Don't do this, MJ. Don't do that, MJ. Oh, that's too dangerous, MJ. I may not have super spider powers, but I'm not made out of glass. You snuck into the middle of an armed military. You know what? Can we not do this right now, please? What a fan. As dead as I would have been the last eight and a half thousand times you saved me. Pretty sure I still owe you a few. <laughs> oh, oh, that's smart. <laughs> hey. I'm sorry I screwed things up. It's just hard being the one who always gets saved, you know? Sometimes I want to do the saving. You are crazy. <laughs> You're amazing. <laughs> this is all my fault. No, not this song again. You are not alone anymore, Pete. Let Miles and me look after Feast. You... you find Norman. You find the cure. Thanks. Partner. I don't know if I can beat him. Maybe you can't. 
Maybe Spider-Man needs help from his friend Peter. What? Peter helped build those arms, remember? If anyone can find a weakness, it's him. Go get him, Tiger. <laughs> I'm sorry, no, it's... You're a scientist. A good one. Yeah, the last project I worked on, I created a monster octopus that almost destroyed the city, so... Yeah. I mean, you do make a hell of a chicken curry. <laughs> I do. Still working on my dumplings, though. Despite these small areas of emotional conflict, MJ has fantastic chemistry with Peter Parker throughout the game, and to the surprise of absolutely no one, they resolve their differences in the third act of the game before repairing their relationship before the credits sequence. MJ is a reporter and has a desire to find the truth no matter the cost, which explains why she's willing to risk her own life going undercover at the Sable base or Tombstone's warehouse, or hell, go behind the back of her employers when it comes to the art gallery mission. Overall, I felt MJ had enough development and was well established in this verse, and to please the people who were stuck in the past, she even had a couple of damsel in distress moments. You know, since it's supposedly a bad thing that she does things herself now. Miles Morales didn't have a lot of screen time in comparison to MJ, however he still came across as being likeable. He's a young man with a lot of enthusiasm towards Spider-Man, and after the death of his father at City Hall, Miles meets Peter and quickly becomes integrated into the main story. When Peter helps him get a job at the Feast Center, when things go south in the third act, however, Miles even shows he's willing to take a leaf out of MJ's book and risk his own safety for the greater good, when he sneaks past an able soldiers and even steals antibiotics to help the sick inhabitants at feast whilst avoiding the rhino. Finally, Miles gets bitten by the new genetically modified spider that MJ unwillingly acquires from their secret lab. <laughs> and becomes a better friend to Peter upon sharing his new powers and discovering that Parker is in fact Spider-Man, starting a student-mentor dynamic which would ultimately be expanded in the DLC, Miles Morales, and Spider-Man 2. Otto Octavius and Martin Lee have a shared hatred for Norman Osborn. Otto holds resentment for his former friend for being fascinated with biology, to the extent that he is okay with performing inhumane and illegal experiments in the pursuit of science. Not only is the existence of Devil's Breath a violation of multiple laws within New York, however the experiment with Martin Lee was the turning point for both villains, as said experiment resulted in the death of Martin's parents in a freakish set of circumstances. Despite their shared resentment for Osborne, however, both of them prior to their downfall do come across as likeable mentor figures for Peter Parker. Otto especially, as we spend a lot of time at the lab, watching moments with him and Peter, developing futuristic, prosthetic technology, in the pursuit of helping others. Despite his good intentions, however, Otto is overly hasty at using the new prosthetic arms, as the neural interface technology has many negative side effects, which ultimately brings out the worst aspects of Otto's character, and effectively gives him the power and desire to act upon his intrusive thoughts exposing the ugly within. They both held resentment towards Nosborn for his actions, sure, yet under their supervillain aliases, they don't bat an eye at causing a citywide pandemic, committing terrorist attacks, and in Otto's case, unfazed at the prospect of beating the crap out of Spider-Man, even though he's fully aware that the costumed hero is none other than his lab partner, colleague, and friend. And they do all of these heinous acts in the pursuit of their own goals. To put it simply, Otto and Martin Lee effectively became the person they hated the most, and it was fascinating and equally heartbreaking to see two likeable figures in Peter's life throw everything they had away in the pursuit of revenge. The other villains don't get nearly the same amount of development, unfortunately, with the exception of Hammerhead, I suppose, in the DLC. However, despite all this, they are still entertaining regardless, and the detailed character bios provide sufficient context as to how the past fights and interactions between the villains and Spider-Man played out, which ultimately helps to raise the stakes when upwards of six of these villains are on the loose in New York following the Raft breakout, and how they hilariously outmatch Spider-Man in the 1v5 scenario. Even the side characters that work alongside Peter were established very relatively well, 
Yuri Watanabe was a pretty under the radar character for many non-comic book fans. However, she quickly became a fan favourite with her interactions with Spider-Man and her strain that the job puts on her, especially in the Turf Wars DLC which further developed her character. In addition to Black Cat and Silver Sable, who were fairly generic in the main game, and in Black Cat's case she wasn't even in the game, you just heard her voice lines, yet they received a healthy amount of development in their respective DLC packages. And if it hasn't become obvious enough already, I really like the characters in this game, and it's a miracle to be honest that the game has such a huge varied cast that all come across as likeable and developed without weighing down the story too much or impacting the DLC or the gameplay itself. So, what about that gameplay? Yes, the thing that people typically think of when talking about video games, and debatably the most important aspect, with the most important aspect of the gameplay in a Spider-Man game being the web swinging, in my humble opinion. The web swinging in Spider-Man games has varied greatly over the years. The early PS1 games essentially let you swing from nothing to traverse in a straight line, it certainly worked as a benchmark for web swinging in a 3D environment, however it was a basic system nonetheless and it lacked any engaging mechanics in addition to just being slow and dull. In the Spider-Man 2 movie game, Treyarch engineered a swinging system which was more physics based. It allowed you to reach breathtaking speeds for the time, whilst also being surprisingly mechanical, mechanically deep, which helped sell the experience. This physics orientated system then became the standard for subsequent Spider-Man games, such as Web of Shadows. Even if the execution of said systems varied with each entry, every game at the very least was a massive step up from the PS1 games and what they had to offer. So how does Marvel Spider-Man compare to those games? Well the swinging in Marvel Spider-Man has received a lot of criticism for supposedly being automated or basic. And I think these complaints are completely unfair, and I think Colin summed it up best in his video, describing the swinging of the PS4 game. I'll let him take over. This is what just holding R2 to swing actually looks like. If you just spend your time swinging like this, then yeah, it's obviously not going to be as fun as it could be. There's so many mechanics and things you can play around with. You can web zip, you can point launch, and with that point launch, you can control whatever direction you want to go in. Or let's say you want to get some height to clear a building real quick, you can hold down the left stick and it will launch you up. If you want to get more of a boost when you're point launching, you can press X when you're about to jump to get more boost. And while it may not be hard to time the X boost, it's still a form of engagement. You can wall run to the side, you can wall run diagonally, you can wall run up and vault over a building, you can wall bounce, you can wall run up and instead of vaulting over a building you can point launch, you can hit a tight corner on a wall run, you can dive to gain more speed, you can land and bounce and then transition that bounce into another dive or back into swinging or into some air tricks. You have to time the pressing of X correctly to maintain the speed while you're swinging and letting go of your web otherwise you're gonna lose some of that speed if you don't press X at the correct time. Or if you want to get more height, you're in control of letting go of your web to make that happen. You have to move your character correctly so that you can keep as much momentum as possible, otherwise you will mess up or you will lose that speed that you've been building. There's a bunch of things in the environment that let you web tunnel through them. You can hit a quick turnaround, which is a lot quicker than the normal way most people would try to turn around while they're swinging. We have so many options for traversal and everything that I've gone over can be intertwined and weaved together smoothly and unlike other Spider-Man games, everything is extremely polished and the camera, which most people don't talk about enough, the camera is always on point and not wonky like it can be for other Spider-Man games. So to sit here and say, it's really just, you know, autopilot. There's no real interactivity with the web system in the game. It feels pretty smooth but it gets very boring in a short amount of time. It's just the fact that as a player, you have zero control over it. You hold down R2, and after like an hour or two of web swinging, it just gets so unbearably boring. That is just nonsensical, and he's not the only channel I've seen say stuff like this. It's just so disingenuous, and it makes the game seem like it's like terrible. Much like the general gameplay, the web swinging isn't overly complicated at first glance, and it is easily accessible for new gamers. However, with enough time and experience, in addition to leveling up the web swinging skill tree and unlocking those new techniques, players are able to utilize different aspects of this deep swinging system to capitalize and perform very satisfying maneuvers around the open world. You can't reach the same speeds of the swinging systems in Spider-Man 2 or Web of Shadows, unfortunately. However, I feel like this game makes up for it, for being extremely polished and with each technique boasting smooth animations, in addition to the camera being always centered and on point. 
And as far as my experience went, swinging in the open world, the camera never got in the way of the web swinging outside of the Electro Vulture boss fight, but even then I was able to manage with practice, and as a result, I thoroughly enjoyed the web swinging, and it never got boring for me personally. Following on from the web swinging is the game's combat systems, and once again, given the intentions of the directors, I feel the combat is introduced pretty well. Initially, you'll start with basic offensive and defensive capabilities against fairly generic standard enemy variety, with basic ranged melee and aerial based attacks. However, as the game goes on, you will learn the more in-depth combat systems against a wider variety of enemies. Spider-Man PS4 demonstrates a clear mastery on display for its combat systems. New players may find the game daunting, as even on the early difficulty settings, enemies are reasonably strong and can shred your health bar in seconds. However, experienced players are able to take advantage of the combat system to effectively toy with large groups of enemies, which can feel highly satisfying, especially when mastered. The game's emphasis on skill is established more so with the focus system. The bar underneath your health will gradually fill as you damage enemies and dodge incoming attacks, and upon reaching certain thresholds, the player has the choice of either regaining a large amount of health or performing a finisher technique, a defensive option, and an offensive option. Not only are these finishers very cinematic and instantly take down targets in one hit, however they are also the primary way of replenishing charges for your gadgets. Speaking of gadgets, I might as well fanboy over Marvel Spider-Man's customization for a second, as when this game released, no other Spider-Man game could match this title's insane customization. You had a little under 50 Spider-Man suits from Spider-Man's history to use, the most of any Spider-Man game at the time, so much so that if you combined the suits in both TASM movie games, you'd have a little over half what this one game brings to the table. And unlike previous games, it isn't strictly for cosmetic changes, as some of them have dedicated suit powers which add to the gameplay. You have a little over 20 of these suit powers at your disposal that you could customise between different suits if you so wished. These powers provided a massive boost to the player in combat, at the trade-off of be having a re relatively long cooldown. My personal favourite being Basil Focus, as a rapidly regenerating focus bar immediately seemed appealing to me. However, others are certainly good too. Web Blossom is unlocked from the get-go, and it's essentially a giant fuck you to enemies in a wide area. The spider arms not only looked great, however also offered you a boost to your damage and range. The resupply suit power is unlocked in the final battle with the anti-ox suit, and it allows you to rapidly regain charges for your gadgets, which can be very useful at dealing with large quantities of enemies, especially in the DLC. And then there's a power which literally makes Spider-Man chat shit to his enemies, and it's every bit as perfect as it sounds. Every Spider-Man suit can also have up to three different suit mods equipped, which provide passive buffs to Spider-Man, such as dealing increased damage after successfully dodging an attack, or becoming more resistant to enemy attacks. Finally, as mentioned earlier, there are eight different gadgets to utilise in the combat. Some are certainly stronger than others, I mean the web bomb and the impact webbing were by far my favourites. However, they are each incredibly useful in their own regard, even if they're sometimes situational, and they help turn the tides of battle in your favour, with all of these gadgets being upgradable. And as if this wasn't enough, levelling up Spider-Man grants additional health, damage and swinging speed, whilst also granting you skill points, and you have three different skill trees to invest these points into. The Innovator tree focuses on improving gadgets and web-based attacks, the Defender skill tree focuses on both offensive and defensive combat skills, and finally the Web Slinger skill tree well, that one should be pretty self-explanatory. With all of these trees existing at refining the areas of the gameplay, respectively, making it overall a very enjoyable experience. Sadly, whilst I think the combat and supporting mechanics are indeed solid for the most part, the same can't be said for the boss fights. Whilst they are rooted in emotion and cinematic spectacle, unfortunately every fight in the game essentially boiled down to webbing the boss up before spamming the basic melee combo whilst dodging wherever necessary. The first Mr. Negative fight Fight, debatably being the worst example, as the entire fight is just one big quick time event. You dodge all the attacks in his combo before repeating the process three times. The fight has the cinematics and it looks pretty good, but it's hollow. Some boss fights are more engaging, such as Shocker, the 1v2 fights against Sinister Six members, Doc Ock's final fight, and both Hammerhead boss fights, 
as you have to utilize the environment to help beat the boss. Also, I do really like the rematch against Mr. Negative. However, even with these examples, they still aren't as mechanically deep and satisfying compared to other PlayStation exclusives, and it doesn't match game series like the Souls games or Bayonetta or Devil May Cry, just to give a few examples. I think those boss fights were far more interesting overall. Unfortunately, this isn't even the lowest point of the gameplay for me. Yeah, surprising absolutely no one, the stealth sections are easily the worst aspects and it's not even close. Now, as Peter, they aren't too bad, as there is a degree of skill involved with using the web shooters to isolate the enemies in order to take them out silently. And hell, once you get the gadgets, you can basically just spam them and kill all the enemies before they realise what's going on. However, as MJ and Miles, it's very much worse, as you can't fight back at all until the very last mission as MJ in the main story, and you have to rely on distracting enemies to traverse these very basic, boring segments. Thankfully, there are differences between the two characters, at least. As Miles, you can hack electronics to confuse enemies and distract them, and as MJ, you can throw gadgets to distract guards and eventually take them out once you get the stun gun. Despite this, however, there's no getting around how dull and repetitive these segments are, although thankfully there are a few silver linings. For one, I liked the Grand Central mission as MJ, when you target the guards for Spider-Man to take down silently, and thankfully the stealth segments only take up a very small segment of the overall game, with each individual segment being relatively short, so at least you won't be playing them for too long. However, if that's the only positive, then you, that should speak volumes as to the overall quality of these stealth segments. They're really not that good. The final aspect of the gameplay would be the side content, in which Marvel's Spider-Man has a variety of options available. The base game alone provides over a dozen side missions, which are admittedly hit or miss in terms of quality. However, the consistent boon to these missions is the interactions that Peter has with the characters present, which, sure, you could chalk it up to being fan service, but hey, I don't mind them attempting to flesh out their verse. In addition to the side content, the game provides a plethora of activities that need to be completed for the player to unlock new suits and gadgets. Whether it's taking photos of famous landmarks, to foiling random crimes with surprising variety, or raiding bases, taking on waves of enemies, or doing challenges for Taskmaster, and... Screwball. <laughs> these activities are harmless enough. You have to do these segments in the story than when there are moments of downtime, and when you're swinging around New York but they are by no means the highlight of the game. Switching gears away from the gameplay, despite being over five years old at this point, Marvel Spider-Man still looks drop-dead gorgeous to this day. New York looks breathtaking, regardless of the time of day, or regardless of the weather. Player models look great, boss fights are previously mentioned do look fantastic, and a reoccurring positive of PlayStation exclusives is that the games always look good, even if the gameplay isn't the best, and Spider-Man doesn't disappoint. However, Spider-Man Remastered took the phenomenal graphics and made them even better to create one of the most beautiful games I have ever played. Seriously, it needs to be seen to believe this could give Red Dead Redemption 2 a run for its money. The game's soundtrack is also fantastic all round, with the main theme being up there with the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man trilogy, Spectacular Spider-Man and the Spider-Man animated series as one of my favourite Spider-Man themes of all time. How many times can you say Spider-Man in a sentence? In late 2018, Marvel Spider-Man received three DLC packs which follow one another chronologically. The DLC content is essentially what you'd expect. They develop the story, introduce new characters such as Hammerhead, or develop existing characters such as Yuri and Silver Sable. They develop the combat by introducing the most challenging enemy types in the whole game. I'm looking at you, Sable minigun guys. Seriously, whenever people try claiming this game's combat system is a joke, I'll point out these fuckers. They shrug off gadgets, can laser you in seconds, and there are even certain set pieces where you have to deal with multiple ones at a time. It was a welcome challenge, don't get me wrong, but Jesus, what a spike. If taser webs didn't exist, then these guys would be awful to deal with. You also get more side missions and suits in the DLC, with you having to 100% the DLC packages to receive the respective suit for that episode. Overall, there's not a huge lot to say about the DLC. All the pros and cons I brought up with the general gameplay and stealth sections still apply here. And since each DLC is only around two hours long, there's not that much here to review. It mainly serves as adding a little extra meat onto the bones of the game. And I should really stress a little extra meat on the bones. Insomniac's first attempt at a Spider-Man game has stood the test of time and all these years later, it remains to be a fantastic superhero game. The stealth isn't very good, however it serves as nothing more 
more than a blemish on what is otherwise a fantastic experience. Would I recommend Marvel Spider-Man? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the general combat and swinging systems are indeed refined and developed further in the sequels. But even so, the OG Insomniac game doesn't lack in those areas and it remains a great game to play. And to be honest, I'll probably say the same thing when Spider-Man 3 releases in a few years time. What's going on guys, it's the Gaming Rift here, and I hope you enjoyed the review of the Spider-Man PS4 game. If you enjoyed the review and you want to see me review more products in the future, feel free to hit the subscribe button and comment down below what game you would like me to look at in the future. Have a good day guys, and I'll see you all in the next one.